pleasure to welcome so many people here this evening. Pleasure, but not really surprised, I have to say, because the BSA thinks its vice chairman is rather wonderful as well. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to honour Gerald tonight. We have a lovely book to celebrate. The editors and Mrs. Carbon have done a fantastic job, and I think really and truly honours our great friend. So without further ado, I'd like to pass to Professor Andrea to begin this evening's proceedings. Cafe. Good evening. Dear Gerald and Lucy, ladies and ladies and gentlemen, I consider myself very lucky that I had the privilege of being Gerald's first PhD student, particularly because this teacher-student relationship was transformed a long time ago into a close and dear friend, deep friendship with Gerald and Lucy. I consider myself very lucky because it is this twin identity which I think confers on me the privilege of addressing you tonight. Uh, on this particular occasion, which is the launching of this very handsome and useful uh, volume, which is presented to Gerald. Uh, Gerald arrived in Crete as sixth form schoolboy at Harrow School to assist in Sickler Hood's excavation at Knossos in 1960. Since then, and for 55 years, Gerald has been researching, publishing, teaching us and educating the public on the prehistoric past of Crete and Cyprus and so many other issues, both of the past and of the present. Gerald is an Oxford University graduate and has been on and off always near this institution. After his graduation, he continued as a research lecturer in Christchurch until he was appointed associate professor at the Classics Department of the University of Cincinnati in 1974 where he worked closely with John Caskey. Six years before this, he had got married to Lucy and while in Cincinnati, they had Leo and Nancy, from whom they now have four grandchildren. One is always surprised to see that uh, Gerald taught in Cincinnati for only 10 years, particularly those of us who know how many professionals he produced in this short period. But Gerald has been, and still is, an inspiring teacher and mentor, both for those who were taught from him at Cincinnati or Reading or the University of Crete, where he served for times as visiting professor, and for many others who have shared his wisdom on archaeology and the Mediterranean past on the occasion of their dissertations or through their collaboration with him in the Stratigraphical Museum, or through long discussions over raki and wine uh, at the taverna or elsewhere. As it is pointed out in the introduction of the present volume, all of us who identify ourselves in very different ways as Gerald students have profited from uh, his humane and spirited personality and from his unique ability to combine the knowledge of the past with a deep and reflective understanding of the later history and contemporary life of the Mediterranean lands and of the world in general. Between 1994 and 2004, Gerald wrote many articles on archaeology, heritage and property as correspondent for the Financial Times. I imagine that this experience probably contributed to the directness, clarity and liveliness that distinguish his scholars, scholarly writings and which I always envy. Gerald's connection to the BSA goes back to the 19, to 1964, when he, he came here as Macmillan student, but of course developed into a connection for life from different posts, including the position of the chairman of the school for several years and as vice president at present. Among the many other concepts and boards that he served or, uh, or still serves, I shall only mention his close association with the Anglo-Hellenic League and the Society for the, for the Preservation of the Greek Heritage. But Gerald is above all a tireless, meticulous and insightful field archaeologist and researcher. As we all know, the long-lived Minoan village with the luxurious villa at Myrtos Pyrgos and the site at Maroni Vurnes in Cyprus with the monumental administrative building are his major and lifelong field projects. I had the great privilege to excavate for one season at Pyrgos and work for several periods on its pottery and a lot of the good archaeological practices that I have been trying to pass on to my students 
all these years were acquired there. Gerard has published two books and organized and edited four other major volumes, including the widely used Aerial Atlas of Crete, a pioneering publication in which he collaborated closely with uh, William Ellie Meyer. He has also published over 100 articles. I admit that I lost count somewhere at the end, and patience as well. Uh, and an innumerable number of reviews and obituaries. One has the impression that he has probably reviewed every book that has been published on Aegean history in the last 25 years. <laughs> Although Pyrrhus and Maroni are two major themes of his writings, the range of topics is impressive, from trade to the history of archaeological thought in minor archaeology, from chronology to social and political organization, from pottery studies to the interpretation of burial practices and gendered identities. His writings encourage the reader to proceed with new questions and new interpretations. They demonstrate his ability to synthesize disparate archaeological data and put them into context that they can make sense in terms of history or better, in terms of the lives of the people in the past. Perhaps for most, they exhibit Gerald's readiness to accept different views and new approaches, theoretical, <coughs> theoretical or analytical, for the investigation of all problems or to discuss the formulation of new questions altogether. This openness to new ideas and interest for different views and understandings of the problems of life in the past and in the present is the quality that characterizes Gerald as a personality. Λοιπόν, Gerald, σου εύχομαι ολόψυχα και σε άλλα με υγεία. And now I'd like to ask Maria Iacov, Professor Maria Iacovo to uh, thank you. Dear colleagues and friends, I have been asked by the editors to present the Cypriot side of Gerald. But if I were to isolate his work in Cyprus from his work in Crete, I fear that the significance of his decisive contribution to the archaeology of the easternmost Mediterranean island would not come forward, especially before an audience that is far better acquainted with the history of research of my known Crete. Hence, this intervention will be put against the prevailing Cretan canvas, which is where I first experienced Gerald's cultural breadth and appreciated, indeed marveled, at the intimacy he had developed with the living world of Crete. More than four decades ago, in 1972, Gerald Cadogan went to Cyprus to participate in the International Symposium on the Mycenaeans in the Eastern Mediterranean. He returned six years later, in 1978, for another <coughs> symposium, this time on the relations between Cyprus and Crete. So far, nothing is the, in the attitude of a British scholar who had been nurtured in the best tradition of minor archaeology could have been interpreted as out of the ordinary. All the big shots of Mycenaean and minor archaeology as well as a younger generation of Aegean scholars, to which Gerald belonged at the time, were eager to participate in these meetings organized by Vasos Karajoris. The participants enjoyed every minute of VK's gallant hospitality, and years later, they would still narrate to their envious students all sorts of anecdotal events that had taken place during those legendary Cypriot symposia. But none of the Aegean participants ever return to initiate a field project in Cyprus. None that is except Jeremy. Why would they? Their hands were full to the extent that they could continue managing their Mycenaean or Cretan projects. They had every right to feel content, and so should Gerald. After all, he had a site that he had excavated in Crete, an important country house on the hill of Pyrrhus, and he had made a name for himself in my own studies. So why did this BSA man went to so much trouble to initiate 
a project on Cyprus in the early 1980s, when the school had abandoned Cyprus upon its independence in 1960. It was a recklessly brave and unconventional move, and by a stroke of sheer good luck and the offer of a generous tact sample doctoral stipend, I happened to find myself in Cincinnati in 1979. In fact, I found myself in the dungeon, the impressively rich, but to my dismay, subterranean research library of the classics department in the <laughs> University of Cincinnati, where I was to leave for some rather dark years. <laughs> I say leave because I do not recall having the time to rise above ground, except maybe when Lucy and Gerald invited us to their home, which was, as I remember with gratitude, quite often. Looking back, I have to admit that I had no clear idea as to where I was heading for my graduate studies or whom I was going to encounter in that school. I knew nothing of Gerald and his courting with Cyprus. Cypriot archaeology was not on offer as a specialized field anywhere, and I doubt whether in those days anybody other than maybe Nicholas Colstrin, maybe even David Trapp, were offering courses in, on Cyprus. <coughs> in any case, specializing on Cyprus was a suicidal act since there was no job market for this curious field of study, and other than the Department of Antiquities, no institution back home that could absorb us. We were a very long way away from the establishment of a Cyprus University. In 1979, when I did go to Cincinnati, Stelios had received his degree and had returned to Thessaloniki. We were to meet for the first time some years later in the school's annex at Knossos. Martha Dimas and Diane Bolger were already in the department, but neither of them could have imagined then that they were going to do their doctorates on Cypriot archaeology. David Wilson was um, um, among my year's new recruits, and he also came to dig at Maroni with the rest of us, though he remained faithful to the CARE project. Mm -hmm. We were both shy and reserved, and it took us more than two years before we could become intimate friends. And I do miss him not being here today. After a year of living in the dungeon, Gerald sensed that I needed to be taken out of this because of health reasons. So he took me along for a study season in the fresh air of Crete. It was the heart of the Cretan winter. The loose boxes in, in the annex were dripping with humidity. We were working in the scrub mouse wearing mittens over painfully swollen fingers. <laughs> and the only one who could enjoy a warm bath was baby Nancy in the kitchen sink. <laughs> but I swear, I laughed and I still cherish every minute of it. It was the most valuable, <coughs> hands-on course on mega island archaeologies I could have ever attended. On weekends, we did landscape reconnaissance on foot, with Sandy McGillivray showing us the Knossian territory as far as the sanctuary for Hannes. With Gerald and Lucy, the trips were to the east and south of the island, and they turned dramatic when Leo's patience was justifiably exhausted after hundreds of kilometers in a car with grown-ups talking in an incomprehensible jargon. There are no words to describe the long-term significance of this intimate experience with the real Crete under Gerald's guidance, especially since he also had Cyprus in mind. It was a day-by-day -day identification and enumeration of divergences, not similarities, that defined the distinct cultural identities of the two megaloniksi. I do not know if there is an, another archaeologist who could say that he or she understood the one, in this case Cyprus, through its diachronic differences from the other. There was nothing stingy about what Gerald would share with his students. Food, wine, and rich ideas were on offer every evening, together with scholarly challenges. I think the one time I saw him with a look of utter disbelief on his face, was when some of the students took him up on one of these challenges. We got up one morning in the Knossos Annex, and I had to explain 
that the better part of his crew had fled overnight by boat to Egypt. <laughs> to test the distance of the sea voyage and indulge on the minor complex with the Delta. Mm. For me, however, the most daring challenge was his questioning Crete's Mycenaeanization. If Gerald could show that in the long durée, Cretan cultural traditions were far stronger than an invasion or a political takeover, then I should also have been able to question the invisible and unfounded Mycenaean and Phoenician colonizations, which had deprived Cyprus from its indigenous history for far too long. The irony is that this venue was open to me by a British scholar. But as I was going to confirm when we began digging at Maroni, Gerald conducted himself in Cyprus in the most un-British and non-colonial fashion. <coughs> if you're wondering what I'm trying to convey, try for a start to read Hogarth in the Journal of Hellenic Studies of 1888. Contrary to how the British archaeologists saw their role in Crete since the 19th century, British archaeological activities on Cyprus since 1879 when the island was ceded to Great Britain, were from the start conceived as a colonial prerogative. Cyprus is the only field for research in classical archaeology which is absolutely under our own control, wrote Hogarth. The outstanding scholarly work that the British School of Athens has done in Crete in the late 19th century finds no contemporary parallel in Cyprus, where British activities could be best described as tomb looting, and Maroni Burnes was one of the many sites that had been victimized. The recent detailed report <coughs> released by Thomas Keeley in relation to the activities of the British Museum's various liaisons in Cyprus are quite shocking. If it were not for the short-term respite which the arrival of J.L. Myers had given to Cypriot archaeology, one would have had to wait for Peter McGaugh to put things right when he was appointed director of the Young Department of Antiquities in 1935. So in 1982, when Gerald took us to Cyprus to initiate the Maroni excavation, more than two decades had passed since the BSA had abandoned Cypriot <coughs> archaeology. At the time, the island was still trying to recuperate from the 1974 invasion that had deprived it from 30% of its territory. Our workmen were refugees that were temporarily housed in nearby villages. Other than myself, <coughs> Gerald was the only one who could speak Greek, though not Cypriot Greek. And I loved and respected him then and there for his genuine sensitivity and his eagerness to adopt a Cypriot vocabulary so that he could communicate with these displaced people who were far less exuberant than the Cretans. I saw him listening attentively to the heavier, more languid voice of Cyprus so that he could encapsulate the Cypriot rhythm. Almost a century after the BM had opened huge ugly pits at Moroni in search of tomb treasures, which they took back to London, Gerald came to the same site and excavated the settlements in press bachelor buildings and industrial units. Aroni Vurnes led Gerald to study the Cypriot management system, which did not direct palaces, but in the end was far more successful, successful than the Minoan in its international commercial achievements. I remember well that there were all sorts of controversial critiques when Gerald decided to leave Cincinnati and return to the UK. Others saw it as a dangerous and unprecedented career digression. But I thought that there was a lot of courage and sincerity in this decision. Instead of feeling abandoned, <coughs> I began to feel closer to Gerald and have felt so ever since, probably because I shared with him this longing, which in Greek is called kaimos, kaimos patridas. It is a painful longing for one's cultural and social space, for the place where one belongs. No wonder that we both thrived after we were able to return to our respective homes. Meanwhile, and despite his withdrawal, what happened in Cincinnati between 1980 and 1986 was quite exceptional. 
since in the course of less than five years, three doctoral dissertations were defended on exclusively Cypriot subjects. I do not know whether I should apologize, especially in the presence of the director of the American School, but I have to admit that I received both an undergraduate and a doctoral degree in the States, which amounts to almost a decade of USA scholarships, without ever becoming a member of the next door neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> scholars whom he did not abandon during the difficult, jobless postdoctoral years. In 1984, when I returned to Cyprus, the number of Cypriot archaeologists who had doctoral degree could be counted on one's finger. There was no university nor a foreign archaeological institution permanently established <coughs> in the conducting field work on the island. The chances of staying in the field were slim unless one was willing to struggle for a position in the Department of Antiquities. Postdoctoral archaeology grants were still a rarity, but as Cypriots, we were excluded from applying to most of them. Neither for the first nor for the last time, Gerald came to the rescue. After alerting Hector Catlin and Peter McGough, he made sure that Cypriots would be allowed to apply for the centenary bursaries of the ESA. I think that in 1986, I must have received one of the very first bursaries, which took me at long last to London, where I was placed under the aegis of Nicholas Colster. Throughout my stay in the Institute, my British family, the Kadagans, offered me the use of their ideally situated London apartment. When Gerald had decided to brave the fluid archaeological landscapes of Cyprus, which defied patterning and had nothing in common with those of Crete. His plan was to widen the geographical horizon of the research scheme so that both islands would be approached from another diachronic perspective that takes stock of their immutable properties. The mark of a great scholar is his ability to approach the past through an appreciation of the living presence. Gerald managed these into very different and very stubborn islands. Here we are today, Greeks from Athens and Thessaloniki, Greeks from Crete and Cyprus, expressing our respect and love to a professor who has been intimately associated with our careers as archaeologists and as teachers. From 1979, when I first met him, to 1998, when I was elected to the University of Cyprus, Gerald remained my most steadfast supporter. Today, every time Gerald Kadagan walks into the archaeological research unit of the University of Cyprus, which was established only in 1992, students and teachers identify him as one of those special people who invested and believed passionately in the establishment of a Cypriot school of archaeology. He is cherished as one of our founders. Thank you, Jeff. And now it's time for the other Megalonisos, Professor Katerina Kovac. <laughs> Ε, με μεγάλη χαρά και συγκίνηση συμμετέχω στη βραδιά και στην τέλεια. να είναι καλή τέλεια. Συμμετέχω στη βραδιά και στην τέλεια αυτή προς τιμή του Τζέραλτ Καντόγκαν και του χαριστήριου τόμου του. Και ευχαριστώ πολύ για την τιμή όλους τους συμβολιστές του βιβλίου ε, και της εκδόσης Καπών, όσο και της τελετής αυτής, την Κάθη Μόρφαν και την Βρετανική Σχολή. Μετά από αρκετή σκέψη, αποφάσισα να μιλήσω ελληνικά, γιατί μάλλον ο Τζέραλτ θα το προτιμούσε έτσι. Ε, θα μιλήσω σύντομα πρώτα απ' όλα για ένα ακριβό μου φίλο, ένα σχετικά όψιμο φίλο των τελευταίων 23 ετών, 
από το σφαιρικό συμβόσιο για τη λειτουργία της μηνοϊκής βίλας. Είναι the function of the minority, δηλαδή το 92. Που έγινε όμως έκτοτε ένα σημαντικό μέλος του προσωπικού και του οικογενειακού μου σύμπαντος, ένας δικός μας άνθρωπος, όπως ο Τζέραλτ ξέρει να είναι. Ακόμη και ο μεγαλόψυχος εγγυητής για το δωμάτιο του γιού μας, του Λουκά, στο Λονδίνο, ένα σχετικά μεγάλο ρίσκο που ευτυχώς έδειξε ανώδυνα ενώ οικονομικά για το γενναίο του Άρντον, τον Τζέραλτ. Για το πόσους πολλούς φίλους έχει ο Τζέραλτ, αρχεί να ρίξει κανεί μια ματιά στα πυκνά περιεχόμενα του βιβλίου για τα δύο μεγάλα νησιά. Οι συγγραφείς είναι όλοι οι συνεργάτες, αλλά οι περισσότεροι και φίλοι. Ε, είχα την τύχη δε, να βρεθώ μαζί του στα τέλη του 90 στο χωριό του Μύρτου και είδα και ένιωσα τους στενούς δεσμούς του και με τους παλιούς ντόπιου του χώρου της πρώτης δικής του ανασκαφής στο Μύρτο Πύργο. Τώρα, όταν ένας φίλος είναι συγχρόνος και μέντορας και συνεργάτης, αυτό είναι μάλλον σπάνιο προνόμιο. Δεν θυμάμαι πράγματι πολλά επιστημονικά μου βήματα στον καλοκαιρινό, στη Γάρδο, στο Πανεπιστήμιο, χωρίς τον Τζέραλτ, αυτοπροσώπος ή πάντως με τη σοφή του γνώμη δίπλα μου. Ο ίδιος διαθέτει μια πλατιά και πολύ πλευρή γνώση, είναι ένας καλλιεργημένος πολίτης του κόσμου, ένας ουμανιστής. Τη γνώση και τη μεγάλη του εμπειρία ξέρει όμω και να τις επικοινωνεί, να τις μοιράζεται χωρίς φιδό, χωρίς πλέγματα, με ταπεινότητα και ψυχική ευγένεια. Για να συνομιλήσει με τους όμοιους ή ίσους του, his peers, αλλά και για να μιλήσει τους νεότερους επιστήμονες, στους, τους φοιτητέ, όσο και το ευρύ κοινό. Δεν θυμάμαι να αρνήθηκε ποτέ μια πρόσκληση για διάλεξη, μάθημα, ακόμη και στους προτυχιακούς φοιτητές στο Πανεπιστήμιο στο Ρέθμινο, ούτε και στην κατάμεστη βασιλική του Αγίου Μάρκου μπροστά στους δημότες του Ηρακλείου. Με την καθαρή συγκροτημένη σκέψη του και προπαντός με τη διαφορετική του αρχαιολογική ματιά, που είναι μεν κλασική, παραδοσιακή, αλλά συγχρόνως και τόσο ανοιχτή, που οδηγεί σε ένα στέλεο συνεχές τολμηρό και χωρίς προκαταλήψεις ξεκλείδωμα της κριτικής προϊστορίας και των ανθρώπων και των κοινωνιών της. Καλό παράδειγμα εδώ είναι η ερετική πρότασή του για το νέο όρο με τα gender, με τα φύλου, αντί για το τρίτο φύλλο που λέγαμε και με το οποίο διαφωνούσε πλήρω στις μηνοϊκές πολιτισμικές συνάφειες στο σχετικό συνέδριο που οργανώσαμε στο έθνο. Αφού επιπλέον ο ίδιος διαθέτει μια εκπληκτική αίσθηση της γλώσσας και των ενιών, που πάει μαζί με τη μεγάλη έννοια του να τελειοποιήσει τα ίδια εξαιρετικά ελληνικά και τα κριτικά του. Όλα αυτά είναι βασικά στοιχεία που συγκροτούν τη στόφα ενός ιδιαίτερου δασκάλου, όπως επιβεβαιώνει το πλούσιο ακαδημαϊκό αποτέλεσμα της δεκαετίας διδασκαλίας του στο Συνσυνάρτη. Τα ομάδα δηλαδή άξιων προϊστοριολόγων, αγωγιών, ανδρών και γυναικών, δύο τουλάχιστον που γνωρίζω είναι οι προλαλήσαντες, ο Στέλιος Ανδρέου, η Μαρία Ιακώβου, και Πάρα πολλοί άλλοι, αρκετοί από τους οποίους συμμετέχουν με μελέτες του στον τιμητικό του τόμο. Στο μεγάλο νησί της Κρήτης, τη δεκαετία του 60, ξεκίνησε ο Τζέραλτ το αρχι... την αρχαιολογική σταδιοδρομία του, αυτήν του αφοσιωμένου και σημαίνοντα σε ευθυνού ειδικού της εποχής του χαρικού στο νησί. Ως μέλος της τέταρτης γενιά των Βρετανών προτεργατών της Κνησού, στην απευθεία γραμμή των Άρθουρ Εύαν, Τζον Πενέπιλη, Σίγκλερ Κουρ. Ωστόσο, η αποφασιστική του συμβολή στι μηνοϊκέ σπουδέ και η εμπλοκή του σε αυτέ τον συνδέουν συγχρόνω με σημαντικού Έλληνε αρχαιολόγου, 
και αυτό είναι για παράδειγμα <coughs> του Νικόλα Πλάτωνα, το Στυλιανό Αλεξίνδρο. Ο ίδιο είναι πράγματι ένα ενθουσιώδη, συναισθηματικό και κάπω μοναχικό στοχαστή των εν γέννη κριτικών πραγμάτων, του τοπίου, τη ιστορία, τη λογοτεχνία, τη ψυχοσύνθεση και του διαχρονικού πολιτισμού στη Μεγαλόνησο. Το ταξίδι του Μέδητο το έκαναν με τη Λούση στη Δυτική Κρήτη. Εκείνος μου σύστησε το Γιώργο Ψυχουνδάκη, το περιστικό μαντατοφόρο της γερμανικής κατοχής, το σύντροφο και συνεργάτη του Πάτρικ Κλιφένορ, τον οποίο εγώ δεν γνώριζα και ας είχε, όπως μου ομολόγησε ο ίδιος, κλέψει πρόβατα από τον παππού μου στα σπουκιά. <laughs> Ενώ πρόσφατα ο αποξυμνός μας τιμόμενος που με εξομολογήθηκε ότι από τις συνταρακτικότερες εμπειρίες του στην Κρήτη υπήρξε η αφήγηση από πρώτο χέρι μιας γνωστής ανογενής δεντέτας. Και το μνημόσυνο για αυτήν, στη γιορτή της Αναλήψεως, μια ηλιόλου στη μέρα ψηλά στο οροπέδιο της Νίδας, στο Ψιλορίτη. Δεν θα μπορούσα να τελειώσω αυτή τη σύντομη υγεία, στη βάση και της φερόμενης μητριαρχικής προϊστορικής κουλτούρας του νησιού που μελετούμε, χωρίς μια θερμή αναφορά στη Λούση, τη σύντροφο και συνοδοιπόρο του Τζέραλτ στη ζωή και βέβαια στις μακρές περιόδους ανασκαφής και μελέτης. Η ίδια έχει διαμέτρητα σεμπίδια με χώματα και ευρήματα στο πεδίο και πληθώρα ως τράκων σε δίσκους στο στρωματογραφικό στη γνωσό. Η Λούση που δεκαετίες τώρα προσπαθεί να καταλάβει μαχητικά, κριτικά, μέσα από τη δική της τη τέχνη και πολιτισμική αντίστοιξη, την περίφημη αυτή εγκύτη που αναζητούμε με τους μηνοίτες και παραμένει βέβαια πάντα μια αγεφύρωτη απόσταση από αυτούς. Αν και από πιο μακριά η Νάνση και ο Λέων που βαφτίστηκε και πρωτοπήγε σχολείο στη Γνωσό και τώρα τα παιδιά τους, ο Άρθουρ, ο Ρόκι, η Ρόζ, η Κάρμεν, είναι εξίσου οικία μας πρόσωπα, με κληρονομημένο από τους γονείς το πάθος τους για τη Μεσόγειο και ελπίζω από τον ερχόμενο Ιούλιο στο Παλέκαστρο και για την Κρήτη. Αγαπητέ Τζέραλτ, είμαστε πολύ τυχεροί και τυχερές που σέρχομαι στη ζωή μας την προσωπική και την επιστημονική. Να ξέρεις και πιο επίσημα από απόψε ότι έχει τη βαθιά εκτίμηση, την ευγνωμοσύνη και την αγάπη μας. Είσαι για μας ένας από τους τελευταίους ευγενείς και αξιόπιστους πρέσβης της κουλτούρας και της πολιτισμικής μας κληρονομιάς, όχι μόνο γιατί γεφυρώνεις με το αρχαιολογικό σου έργο τα δύο μεγάλα νησιά, την Κρήτη και την Κύπρο, με το δικό σου, το Βρετανικό νησί, αφού κυρίω μετά τους δύο παράλληλους παραδέχεσαι ότι είσαι και εσύ νησιώτης, αλλά κυρίως επειδή είσαι ο ίδιος η καλοκτισμένη γέφυρά μας με ένα κοινό παρελθόν μας που ξέρει να σέβεται και να προστατεύει τις αναλογίες όσο και τις διαφορετικότητες των ατόμων, των ομάδων, των πολιτισμών. Αντιπροσωπεύει σε ένα ιδιαίτερα σοβαρό κεφάλαιο του νεοτερικού κόσμου του διαφωτισμού, της ελεύθερης ιδεολογίας και διανόησης, στην αντίστοιξη της ασύλληπτης καταστροφικής μανίας του φανατισμού που ξαναφευγεύει στις μέρες μας, στοχεύοντας τυφλά ανθρώπους και μνημεία, ακόμη και αρχαίγονες μήτρες μας, όπως πολύ πρόσφατα τη Μεσοποθαμιακή Ασυριακή Μιλούτ και το Μουσείο της Μοσχούλης. Σε ευχαριστούμε για όλα. I will be very, very brief because my role is really to introduce colleagues.
Dolan and, and then Gerald, but I would like to remind Gerald that in 1996, the Gridological in Iraqio, when he was chairing a session, um, a session where he proudly said that um, six out of the eight speakers were either students of his or uh, he had examined her PhDs, and, and these included Colin, uh, Nico Mugliano, Carl Nappet, Marina Panagiotaki and myself, and I'm obviously forgetting somebody. Um, this phrase, yeah, all of the way home, mentioned that, uh, at that occasion at the Gridological, was a sentence he often used in the future uh, uh, when we met, and he would juxtapose it with one that directly referred to things I was saying. Um, then steu ego, and that was when I realized that Gerald knew not only me, but the Greek mentality uh, <laughs> better than I would like to, to admit. The book that we are uh, uh, presenting today, um, I, I can clearly say, then steu even though I'm one of the editors, ala ya all of this is because you have, you have peer reviewed at least about half the papers. <laughs> I'd like to begin this evening, uh, thank you, um, by thanking uh, my co editors to start with, uh, but uh, particularly Rachel and Moses Capon and uh, all the people in the Capon uh, editorial office, particularly Eleni Valma, Mina Manda, and Michaelis Tsanatakis, um, for their marvelous work in putting uh, this volume together. <coughs> it, it really is a work of art apart from anything else, yeah, and yeah. thank you for that. And um, I think we all have to thank uh, particularly the Levendis Foundation and the Institute for Aegean <coughs> Prehistory for um, uh, giving generous grants, uh, which actually enabled the volume to come out in the first place. A volume of collected papers uh, in honour of anyone seems to take on a life of its own unless a specific theme is set out, as it was with the volume in honour of Sinclair Hood, an important early mentor of Gerald um, and fellow Harrovian, or that's Harrow School, like Sir Arthur Evans and Lord Elgin, Lord Byron, and Benedict Cumberbatch, and, <laughs> and a few others. <laughs> this is a volume created by the authors, and we, we as editors do thank all 30 or so authors uh, very much. Uh, it's taken quite some time to put the papers together, but it doesn't matter, we got there in the end. But the uh, authors themselves really created the subject. Where, so that the subject matter fell within the Crete and Cyprus zone, and so a reference to the two great islands seemed appropriate. I will give a very rapid review of the book, concentrating on the papers that are most concerned with Gerald's excavations, Mirtos Pyrgos and Moroni Vornes. Uh, in the book, I give a very, very um, brief rundown on Mirtos, uh, which I will just read out here. Uh, but... There we are. The site of Myrtos Pyrgos, excavated from 1970 under the direction of Gerald, goes back into the early Bronze Age at least, when it coexisted for a while with Furno Corophy to the east. By the Middle Bronze Age, it had become an important village with a central building standing on a prominent hill above the river Myrtos and overlooking the Libyan Sea. Prestige objects and pottery in the protopalatial central building, Pyrgos III, have such strong affinities with Malia to the north that a political connection has been suggested, although Cadogan thinks more in terms of marriage ties and an entente cordiale. He views Myrtos uh, with its country house as a good example of rural, decentralised, smart living and governing in both protopalatial and neopalatial Crete. The country house that you see on the slide was thoroughly rebuilt in the best contemporary neopalatial style and filled with fine objects and pottery which then, Pyrgos V, reflected strong ties with north-central Crete and Knossos. Only the country house was destroyed by fire 
in late Minoan 1b, implying human rather than natural agency. The first paper in the volume uh, is entitled uh, Good People of Eastern Crete by, by Paul Holston and Varasia Isakizu. Uh, and they explain how the aridity of southeast Crete may have shaped the lifestyle of farming communities in both the recent um, and distant past. There are lots of nice anecdotes and a serious discussion of bare fallow, that's leaving cultural land uncultivated in order to store more water in the soil. It turned out that larger landholders could afford to do this, whereas the smallholder alternated winter cereal crops with fodder. Peter Warren turns his sights on uh, a paper Gerald wrote for Warren's, uh, Warren's own festschrift in a paper entitled In Divino Veritas, marking over 50 years of friendship between them. Warren defends the identification of the so-called goddess of Myrtos that you see on the screen in the drawing here as just that, a divinity, a divinity. She was found in Gerald's Trench on the 27th of July, 1968. Gerald is let off lightly compared to Todd Whitelaw, an, an early minor and sparring partner of Peter Warren, um, one might uh, suggest. And it is suggested that Gerald's interpretations of this great beauty as, as symbolic are not incompatible with his own, namely that she was a local divinity that stood on an altar in room 92, um, a view supported by Nano Marinatos in her book, My Known Religion. Next, Todd Whitelaw grapples with Furnu Corifi and Pyrgos in his Divergence of Civilization. He uses the two sites in a broad consideration of settlement strategies in this part of Crete, suggesting that hamlets like Pyrgos and the much smaller Furnu Corifi may have been the norm instead of isolated farmsteads, and that this is a cross-cultural response to endemic raiding. Extensive and intensive networks were essential for the survival of these communities, and the pottery can be used as an index, with EM2A pottery coming from far and wide, but being limited in quantity and size. <coughs> uh, mostly small, finer vessels from the Messera and Asterusia. In EM2B, this changed, with around half of all pottery being imported from the northern part of the Isthmus of Arapetra, and including container vessels such as Pithi. Furno Corifi was a marginal community and, once, uh, and was unable to survive the EM2B destructions, whereas the larger Pyrgos recovered and went on from strength to strength. Karl Nappet, in Palatial and Provi Provincial Pottery Re Revisited, has another look at Kamara's wear, so long associated with palaces because it was innovative and well execu executed and found in abundance at Festos. <coughs> Day and Wilson, on the basis of a number of imports to Knossos, suggested that Knossos was a Kamara's ware consumer and not a producer. Napit disagrees with this and suggests that because places like Myrtos also have their own production of Kamara's ware, innovation can occur as easily, as easily at Hamlet level as it can at the palace level. This, he suggests, argues against a strictly hierarchical society and for, a f and for a flatter house society of the kind that Jan Driesen has recently been proposing. <coughs> ah. There we are. Eleni Hatsaki looks at ceramic production and consumption at the ne neopalatial settlement of Myrtos Pyrgos, focusing on the so-called in-and-out bowl, a well-known type found in Middle Minoan 3 Krosos and Late Minoan 1 Palekastro, as well as in LM1 at Myrtos Pyrgos. The elaborate, elaborately decorated examples at Myr Myrtos appear to derive from large bronze two-handled serving bowls. Less attention is paid to smaller handleless bowls with linear de decoration, which were used for consumption. This may imply that attention was paid to the serving vessels and the people who provided the food or drink, rather than to the consumers who used the bowls. The providers were seeking to make their mark in society and may well have done so at banquets that took place in the courtyard in front of the country house. Emilia Oddo 
echoes some of the sentiments of Eleni's paper when she discusses the fill of the large Myrtos Pyrgos cistern on the north slope of the hill. She suggests that rather than being rubbish thrown in over a long period of time, it was a single event, either clearing up after a destruction or, more likely in her view, clearing up after a feast further up the hill. John Younger, in a flight of fancy and the paper dedicated to Gerald's wit, imagination and creativity, <laughs> uses the Randall, uh, the Randall that he and Paul Rehack found at Myrtos Pyrgos, that's the one at the top, and another from Gournia, the one at the bottom, to suggest that <clears throat> if one is related to the other, five bulls may have been sent from Gournia to the sanctuary of Katosimi, Myrtos being en route. When they arrived at Myrtos, each was laden, up with, uh, laden with a unit of gold, he suggests, before going on up to the High Line Sanctuary in the company of a pyrgiot. pyrgiot. As he suggests, you can take it or leave it. <laughs> Far less fanciful is the paper by Judith Weingarten on stamped pot handles at Pyrgos, where she notes that the most striking feature of glyptic at the site is that all seal impressions are stamped on pot, pot handles like those you see on the screen. There aren't very many of them. Judith argues that the pot handles are neither evidence for major administrative system uh, for a major administrative system, nor for household management. Not, notwithstanding Gerald's views. She wonders whether one pot out of a batch might not have been marked as destined for some special use, such as a public offering, or to be taken somewhere and offered there at the end of a pilgrimage. Borja Legara Herrero's title is my favourite, I think. Um, it, uh, a square tomb with a round soul. The Metos Pergos tomb in the funerary context of Middle Bronze Age Crete. After discussing different kinds of round uh, and rectangular tombs, with examples from Moklos, Gurnia, Malia, uh, Chrysolakos, and Archanis Fourni, he suggests that rather than labelling the Myrtos tomb as a burial place for an elite group, it might be better understood as the burial place of a community or social group not dependent on wealth or social status, but on co-residence or kinship, like that proposed for Tholos tombs. He suggests that the tomb is very stubborn and difficult, quite unlike the excavator, Gerald Cadogan. <laughs> Staying with the dead, Jonathan Musgrave, who has looked at a lot of people's bones, discusses the skeletal and den dental health of the Myrtos population buried in the tomb. He discovered various points of interest, not least that in its final phase, the main tomb chamber was reserved for males, although females, fetuses, neonates, and other juveniles were found in the ossuaries. The absence of trauma on the male bones might indicate, he suggests, that they had little to do with agriculture or fishing, i.e. that they were somewhat elite. He also suggested that the prominent chins of three individuals might indicate some family likeness or relatedness. Argiron Nafgliotti also examined a examined a limited amount of osteological material using strontium isotope analysis. The results were somewhat inconclusive, although she suggests that one person may not have been brought up in the Myrtos Valley, although they may well have been from Crete. Clearly, a great deal more work needs to be done before this method can reach its full potential in prehistoric Crete. A paper by Stuart Manning on the date of the destruction of the country house at Myrtos concludes on the basis of radiocarbon dating, and <clears throat> uh, not surprisingly, that the LM1B late destruction of Myrtos should be around 1500 BC, giving the LM1 period a length of between 107 and 150 years at 68.2% probability. Many would still consider this far too long and too early, but the problems of chronology are not yet solved to everyone's satisfac satisfaction in spite of the Theron olive branch. And now we have Manning's new critique and updating of his own test of time. Still, it is an, an interesting and modified interpretation of the radiocarbon evidence uh, for the Myrtos country house. Turning more briefly to non-Myrtos papers, Alexandra Koretsu and Anna Margarita Yassink publish a beautiful and rare two-sided prism 
uh, hieroglyphic seal from, uh, the, uh, from Mount Yuktas. While Olga Kriskovska tells us why cats are different uh, in Middle Minor and Glyptic. She suggests that they were different from the standard repertoire of pictorial motifs and may have been either a true Cretan hieroglyphic sign or a supplementary... Do we not have cats? No. Well, we may come across cats later. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> anyway, these cats may have been either a true Cretan hieroglyphic sign or a supplementary identifier. Marina Paniutaki tells us about the real key to true life, Egyptian blue, the substance for eternity, its use, distribution, and meaning. It's a nice companion piece to a fairly comprehensive list of blue lapis lazuli or lazurite uh, in the Greek Bronze Age by Jim Muley and Phil Betancourt. It was not a common material, having been imported from Afghanistan and usually came in the form of small objects like seals or jewellery, like those from Knossos on the, on the screen. On the left, an imported cylinder seal from next to the northwest lustral basin, and on the right, a local seal from the backyard of the South House. Then it's my turn, with more than a nod in the direction of Nic Nicholas Platon's 1954 article on pillar crypts and the shrines above them. I discuss rooms at Knossos with more than one gypsum pillar, beginning with my own and Hogarth's excavation of the southwest house uh, that you see at the top of the screen. It's entitled, Things are seldom what they seem, because the final plan, plans of rooms as excavated do not always correspond to the original layout. Suffice to say that I suggest that these rooms facilitated uh, ground floor circulation and in certain instances supported larger uh, rooms above without the pillar arrangement being repeated upstairs by columns. Malcolm Wiener then takes the opportunity to discuss the possible causes of the late my known 1B Cretan destructions and assembles all the evidence he can, not least from the recent Kuklaki excavation of the cemetery at Han Yao, uh, that you see on the screen, apart from the two swords on the right, which are from Zafar Papura, Knossos, to support the arrival of mainland Mycenaean forces at Knossos and Han Yao for a range of possible reasons, and he lists the likely scenarios in some detail. Katerina Kopper, Kopperka presents an overview of the work of Minos Kalikarinos, the first known excavator of Knossos, a portrait of whom is shown for the first time. She also illustrates five of the surviving Kalikarinos pithoi from Athens, London, Paris times two, and Iraklion on the right, the latter recently identified as a probable Kalikarinos pithos in the museum storerooms. The late Stylianos Alexiou wrote a paper on the wall paintings from room five of the West House at Akrotiri Thera. Well aware that they are among the most discussed frescoes from the site, he ventures his opinion that the four walls of the room represent four separate scenes involving Akrotiri on Thera I, the Nile, the east coast of the Peloponnese, and of course Crete. He was of the opinion that the Cretan element at Akrotiri has been um, um, greatly underplayed by scholars. On goat hair, a paper by Harriet Blitzer, is a fascinating discussion of the properties, processing and uses of goat hair in the late Ottoman Aegean, although um, Harriet ranges as far as Mesopotamia in her treatment of the evidence. Goat hair was so strong and water-resistant and long-lasting that it was used in many different crafts and industries. She chose to offer this topic since, in her opinion, Understanding its relevance requires the kind of broad-minded approach to culture that Gerald has. Then Gerald's former student, David Wilson, tackles not, not the early Bronze Age in Crete, but EB2 uh, seal impressions at Ierini on Caer. He concludes that they most likely represent the symbolic use of seal stamping as a social marker or family identity. Moving to Messenia, but keeping a Cretan perspective, Jack Davis and Sharon Stocker have a paper entitled Crete, Messenia, and the Date of Tholus Tomb 4 at Pylos. They review the evidence um, for contacts with Crete and then present three pots from the Tholos, two of which 
uh, on the left and center, indicates its use in Middle Hellenic III, perhaps as early as Middle Minoan III-A in Cretan terms, that is the later 18th century or beginning of the 17th. It illustrates the relatively early use of ashlar masonry, broadly contemporary with a more prolific use of ashlar on Crete. In general, there are significantly more imports from Crete and Kithra in the period of the shaft graves at Pylos than the excavator Carl Blagan understood. Lastly, in the Aegean section, Vance Waters examines continuity between the Bronze Age and classical between Bronze Age and classical Greece, suggesting that the evidence is of two types. Firstly, there are a number of concepts, practices, and institutions that look as if they can be traced back to the Bronze Age. And secondly, a type of continuity was, was created by the classical Greeks to reaffirm a link with the heroic Bronze Age past, as one can see in this attic kylix by the Codrus painter, where the exploits of Theseus are depicted with Theseus killing the Minotaur center stage. <coughs> Moving to Cyprus, <coughs> the British Museum was the first to investigate uh, Moroni Vournez, as we've heard, searching for tombs in 1897. The site, a few hundred metres inland from the south coast of Cyprus, was excavated methodically by Gerald Cadogan of the University of Cincinnati from 1982 onwards. These recent excavations uncovered two large buildings, the Ashlar Building, uh, that you see here, and the West Building of the late 14th to early 13th centuries BC, Voronezh III, with evidence for a predecessor of the Ashlar Building, contemporary with a sunken structure called the Basin Building, <clears throat> a structure quite unique in Cyprus. Evidence for small-scale metallurgy, including slag, spillage, and, ox and ingot fragments was recovered from Voronezh phases two and three, with its fine ashlar masonry and beautiful white mud brick, the ashlar building was the most imposing of the settlement, and with the west building comparable to building 10 at nearby Calavasos Ios Demetrios. The Moroni buildings, belonging, probably belonging to a major settlement stretching south to the sea that you see in the distance, seem to have worked in tandem, providing storage and working areas for olive oil and cloth production as well as areas for copper smelting, which may be related to industrial performance as opposed to large-scale production. <coughs> David Sewell gives an overview of sites in the Moroni Valley and their relationship with the sea, showing that an explosion of wealth <coughs> um, in tombs in the area, uh, an explosion of wealthy tombs <coughs> in the area in the late Bronze Age coincides with greater seafaring stone anchors on the seabed, and rare boat models from the Moroni British Museum tombs demonstrate the close connection with the sea in the late Bronze Age. Jan Driessen has studied both the Myrtos country house and the Moroni Ashlar building, and identified both as powerhouses, despite their obvious differences. Monumentality, complex planning, storage, courtyards, and administrative evidence are all key elements of powerhouses. In the case of the Moroni Ashlar building, the building itself was more important than the occupants, its mere presence being a sign that certain social and economic activities were intimately connected with clearly defined, uh, defined spaces. The 13th century Ashlar building sits on top of some of the tombs excavated by the British Museum in 1897. It is from these tombs that came the famous, in Cretan terms, uh, late Minoan 3A flask that might have sparked the imagination of Gerald in the first place. Carol Bell is publishing the decorated Mycenaean uh, pottery from the recent excavations. The complete amphoroid craters here and three fragments of a chariot crater towards the top are from the British Museum um, excavations, whereas the other shirts are from the recent dig. The large number of chariot craters represented, when taken with others from the Near East, show that this part of Cyprus was in very close contact with the Aegean in the 14th and 13th centuries BC. Silvia Ferrara discusses the unreadable Cypro-Minoan inscriptions and potmarks from Moroni. One is actually a rare text on the shoulder of a vase that you see here, illustrating that the script was used locally as at Calabasas nearby. <coughs> Anja Ulbrich 
is to publish the archaic to Hellenistic sanctuary that reused about one third of the Ashtar building. It is identified by the limestone votive statuettes and large amount of post-Bronze Age pottery, making it one of over 220 rural, rural sanctuaries in Cyprus, covering something like four centuries. Some new walls were added in the Ashtar building, as well as a large altar that you see here next to a sunken pithos. Ulbricht suggests that the statues are evidence for the worship of Aphrodite and Apollo. A 6th century votive head of a youth, now at Amherst College in the US, is the subject of a paper by Murray McLennan and Pamela Russell. They recount its colourful journey from Cyprus, where it was excavated, or at least acquired, by Chesnola, uh, to its final resting place in the States. Moving a few kilometres north to Calavasos Ias Dimitrios, Allison South excavated a very large structure known as Building 10, the same size as Moroni's Ashlar and West buildings combined, and comparable to the Ashlar building at Enkemi and Building 2 at Alassa. Moroni went out of use a bit earlier in, the, <coughs> in late, uh, late Cypriot 2C than, the, uh, than Building 10. Both were connected to the production and storage of olive oil, graphically illustrated at Calavasos by over 50 pithoi, and both were connected to metallurgy. Calavasos has some evidence for administration, though it should be remembered that compared to contemporary Aegean sites with Linear B archives, the level of administration must have been low. In a very interesting paper, Diane Bolger addresses gender and pottery production in prehistoric Cyprus, examining three case studies ranging in date from the Neolithic to the early and middle Bronze Ages. The idea that ceramic homogeneity between sites might be the result of female potters moving to new villages when married, taking their style and technique with them, within the context of a patrilocal society, appears to be totally untenable. And she suggests that we look at the full process of pot making, from excavating and gathering the clay down to the firing of the pot, it becomes obvious that models of joint or collaborative labour are more appropriate than the sharply polarised allocation of tasks along gender lines. She also suggests that the collaborative model will uh, work best in relatively non-hierarchical egalitarian societies. Finally, George Papasavas and Lina Cassianidou give us a review of the production and consumption of copper and bronze in the Cypriot Late Bronze Age. An increase in copper production in else, uh, Late Cypriot 1 to 2 was for the export market. There was a huge influx of luxury goods from abroad, but very little bronze found its way into Cypriot tombs. So Enkemi tomb 93, that you see on the left here, the richest of all Late Bronze Age tombs in Cyprus in terms of gold, contained no bronze whatsoever. <laughs> this changed in the 13th century, uh, the time of the Ashlar building of Moroni and Calavasos building 10, when home consumption took off, which Papasavas has called the institutionalization of bronze, which became increasingly common in tombs, superbly illustrated by the British Museum 13th or 12th century four-sided stand, probably from Curion on the right here, with two figures each carrying an, ox, an oxide copper ingot so symbolic of late Bronze Age Cyprus. Uh, thank you very much. Now, um, and I'll ask Azani to make a little presentation. First, many thank yous. At the surprise, surprise celebration in Oxford three years ago, I was near tears, as I have been several times since, especially when I saw a little, but truly not much, 
of what had been written for the book. And although it has long ceased to be a surprise, I'm still emotional, both at the book and at, of all, and at all of you who have come or returned tonight for this celebration. My first big thanks are to you for coming. Archaeological existence depends on the parer of friends, colleagues, teachers and students. Four categories which, thank goodness, are often completely intermingled and are all here tonight wearing one, two, three or four hats, as applies completely to our speakers. Thank you all very, very much. My next thank you is to Cathy Morgan, who, with Rahil and Moises Capon, has invited us here to her house, to which I first came with my mother to have a drink with Rachel Hood in summer 1958. <laughs> thank you very much, Cathy, and thank you for the fantastic job you've done for the school these past years, and many happy years ahead in your new post at All Souls in Oxford. Then there are the thank yous for the book. I saw it last night and, if emotional before, was now utterly bowled over. It is a terrific volume, superbly edited by Colin, and I know how much work it is, with Eleni and Stelios, with excellent contributions which I'm just starting to learn much from, and beautifully produced by Rahil and Moises and their team. The quality and elegance of whose work I knew already from the Aegean world that Yanis Kalanakis edited from the Ashmolean, and from the Meletes volume of the two on Crete Egyptos that Alexandra Carezzo assembled. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, editors, publishers, and authors. Heartfelt thanks too from all involved to the Institute for Aegean Prehistory and the A.G. Levendis Foundation for sponsoring the book but also, of course, for their imaginative, enlightened, and deeply generous support of many facets of archaeology and Hellenic studies around the world, not least here at the British School, and at Knossos, and for our work at Myrtos and Moroni. We are blessed to have such benefactors, generous, expedition, expeditious, and understanding of the needs of our quests. This reminds me of the early days at Myrtos, when it was so easy to apply for a grant from the British Academy. A two-page letter, <laughs> including five lines of budget, with a request for £500, and presto, the cheque came soon. It may not sound much, but in those days we fed people well on 22 drachmes a day. Myrtos is the only dig I've gained weight on. <laughs> As this wonderful book on the two islands demonstrates, archaeology is not just about the parea of learning and research. It is also about the parathesis, the tradition of scholarly work. And as ours is a practical discipline, probably more so than any other branch of history, it means that we're not just airy-fairy intellectuals in an aristophanic basket in the clouds, but that we, we must also be down to earth and know how to write labels, buy plastic bags, deal with plumbing, or find a donkey to carry the zimbilia, <laughs> or at least how to find the people who do know. <laughs> For all this, whether practical or narrowly academic, it is the system of formal and informal apprenticeship inherent in the parer and parathesis of archaeology that is so important. As a schoolboy, I went on digs in Sussex, Thanks to that, and to kind words from masters of school, Sinclair Hood took me on in 1960 for the Royal Road under Hugh Sackett, and after three weeks, my first trench of my own. Truly terrifying, and Sinclair had a temper then, at the early Minoan houses by the south front of the palace. Luckily, he gave me Spiros Vasilakis, Andonis's father, to keep me doing the right thing. There, too, I met Nicholas Coldstream, who became a good friend and mentor, and Anthony Snodgrass. Next year, the new boys at Knossos were Peter Warren and Mervyn Popham. In 1962, Sinclair taught how to look for sites and how the ancients saw the landscape, and two years later, how to analyse pottery. At Lefkandi and Knossos, 
Mervyn and Hugh demanded the intellectual rigour one needs, often painfully, to decide where to draw the lines on sections that become at once the foundation of archaeological analysis and writing history. Later that decade came the help, came the help of Hector Campling, Christopher Hawkes and Nicolas Platon. Platon revealed the known culture to Lucy and me in a four-hour tour of Zacros ending by moonlight. Hawkes, like Gordon Child, showed how a classical background can lead to prehistory. And when, newly married, I introduced Lucy to him on the steps of the Ashmolean, he turned his bright eyes to ask her, did you do it before you met him? <laughs> we assumed he meant archaeology. <laughs> queried what one meant, as zealous as, as if he was teaching not Aegean prehistory, but the analytical philosophy from Plato to post Wittgenstein that was an unavoidable, unavoidable but invaluable part of Oxford classics. Stelios Alexiou was another great questioner. Look how he subverted the romantic idol of Apex Minoica. Minoan defence was his first thought when he came to inspect the Pyrgos dig. Piergos was blessed by a wonderful site, fantastic position, top-class architecture, fabulous pottery, and a terrific team, including Stelios, Robin Barber, Bill Kavanagh, Nikos Vaskalakis, Romwe Hanke, Petros Petrakis, Cressida Ridley, David Smythe, and Andonis Zithianakis. They were happy, formative, and hard-working years when some realization of the diachronic character, culture, and traditions of one Megalonizos and the interaction over millennia of man and place began to shape how one could approach his prehistory. Cincinnati brought, besides a new excavation on the other Megalonysos, new teachers, new colleagues, new friends, many of them here tonight and by now old, old friends. <laughs> how much one learned about the Middle Bronze Age, whether Minoan pottery from Stelios, or Kea from Jack Davis, or Lerner from Carol Zerner. Then came the Cyprus team of doctoral students, led by Maria, who for many years now has taught me so much about her great island. And at a site that the excavator told the British Museum in 1897 was a complete frost, we came upon one of the first of Cyprus's monumental buildings, perhaps the very first. The team included Maria and Colin, and also Diane Bolger, Jan Driesen, Ellen Hersher, Sturt Manning, Pam Russell, David Sewell, David Smythe again, and David Wilson. What an able group. It takes years to start to understand the nuances of ancient culture, so it is a relief that help has never stopped, with Katerina leading me into island cultures and ever new and not Anglo-Saxon, but French-influenced, ways of tackling the Minoans or sussing out with Carl Nabbit the Entente Cordiale between Malia and Myrtos, or following Eleni into the complexities of the era when Knossos ruled, or this past autumn, a pull on the road to Damascus moment when Irene Galli pointed out the physical, psychological and symbolic impact of putting new, higher burial layers in built tombs in Crete, constricting space and making people walk alive or lie dead over bodies centuries old. Apprenticeship is perpetual, which is the moment to see a few photographs, a small random deposition from early years in archaeology. We start with we start with this young man, later founder of Eliniki at Aria, just about to leave the school of Evans, Hood and Byron, who was the first living Greek I met, and not Pericles or Evripides <laughs> as born in school. On to 1962, Hood and Warren are on parade during our travels in Crete. Then the Pyrgos dig with uh, the foreman Andonis Zidianakis and Nikos Vaskalakis, 
who followed him as foreman. The two of them are sitting on the bench there. And here is Yorgos Vasilakis, one of Andonis's uncles, who dug with Evans and had danced with Venizelos. <laughs> when the long study sessions began, the help of Ronwy Hanke, Petros Petrakis, whose wife was once cook in this house, and David Smythe was essential. And events like Leo's christening was a, were a good break. <laughs> Here at Hagia Sophia, Knossos, is Britain's bright new hope in antiquarian bookselling, <laughs> supported by Jack Davis, uh, whom I'm sure you can all see, uh, and Leslie Fitton, now keeper of Greek and Roman at the British Museum, and two Stellier, plus Kiki Lembesi and Costis the virus. Kiki, here you are. Oh, sorry. There's Kiki and there's Costis the virus. Uh, 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 among the other archaeologists. Then came Moroni. Leo, by now six, and helping prospect for sites with Maria and Martha Thieves. Here we are, uh, and those who worked at Moroni will know this house, which was the Apotheke uh, for many years, uh, very well. And while prospecting, uh, it led to a half-day rescue dig, since the southern water main of Cyprus was about to go through Vurnitz. And in this unusual excavation, I kept the notebook, and the Pickman in the green shirt is oh, sorry, I haven't got this sorted yet. Uh, the Pickman in the green shirt is Vassos Karyorgis, <laughs> director of the Department of Antiquities. <laughs> when we started a year later, the pipe had moved 500 meters inland. And here are two of the teams of Moroni together with Master Pickman, Simeon Clonaris, who by then had been digging for 55 years, and pictures of Moroni and Myrtos to end the little show. <laughs> Friends and colleagues and all age apprenticeship are vital, and recognizing that we practice a down-to-earth discipline we investigate the daily lives and occasional deaths of ancient people and try to create wide-ranging history from the material evidence we assemble while having to accept that so often we start from aporia. We just do not know. We do not have the song and dance or the stories they told. We may have occasional peeps into their religions, but hardly more. We do not know their languages. We see a tiny selection, mostly upper class, of their skeletons, and we barely know where the majority of people lived. If welcome to Socrates, such ignorance is something that colleagues nowadays seem often to pass by. Perhaps in unadmitted dismay at the inadequacy of our explanations, they compensate by long words for little events and can pile on introductory slabs of theory to turn an inductive bottom-up discipline, where any interpretation stands only until a better one appears, into subjective, top-down, all-in-my-own-term statements that may well confirm what they posited at the start, but tell us little about the ancients. <laughs> weasel words and weasel attitudes abound. In the secular tradition of the Enlightenment, religion is reduced to the safe PC word, ritual. No question of contaminating one's interpretation, heaven forbid. Yet the odds are that it was religion, and not just ritual. And if so, to dismiss it as ritual is much the same attitudes as the West has shown in its totally inept and arrogant handling of, say, Islamic religious extremism, failing to see that, because it doesn't matter to us, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter to them, as true for prehistory as now. Or one enhances the importance of studying kitchen pottery by calling it utilitarian, a travesty to philosophy. And, I wonder, do the scholars of 
utilitarian ceramics go into the kitchen and talk with their spouse about which utilitarian bowl or saucepan to use? I bet they don't. Why then burden the ancients with pompous pseudo-utilitarianism? And thus feasting, an exciting concept in the worlds of TV dinners, carry out and order in, where the family barely eats together. But in the Mediterranean, of Yaya presiding at Sunday lunch, and the Glendy with meat consumed by the kilo, so what? Feasting is as old as time, and I'm sure has always been diacritical. In medieval halls, it was a matter of being above or below the salt, and competitive. Think of 900 guests at a wedding feast on the school playground at Palakastro, or the weddings in Cyprus with tables down the whole village street. That's enough of being a grumpy old man. <laughs> the fun of archaeology does not go. It remains a thrill to understand a little better, even if we're still far off, how the ancient Cypriots and Cretans lived and supported themselves, how they used their territories, how they viewed their neighbours, how, perhaps, they worshipped, and how they created the worlds we see at Enkemi and Pelepaphos, Knossos and Petras, and in the Heraclean and Nicosia museums. And to compare what we learn with the long histories and practices of both islands before and after the Bronze Age. If it's demanding to write clearly and modestly, allowing room for the readers to make the connections themselves, and not bombarding them with seemingly profound observations that are but trite trivia, it remains exciting to try to do this especially through the eyes and experience of others in the field, but most of all through the eyes and experiences of many Cretans and Cypriots over many years, who welcome us to their islands, let us dig, and teach us their remarkable long-lived cultures that help so much to explain what we grapple with in prehistory. So my final two thank yous are to the people, the islanders of Crete and Cyprus, and to the authors, editors, and publishers of the book, Helios Asif Haristok. <laughs>